Hi everybody, welcome to my backyard this afternoon, and today we're talking about Genesis chapter 25. Uh, this has to do a little bit with uh, sibling rivalry, and it, it <laughs> a little bit, but mostly it has to do with valuing what the Lord has given to us, and what we received as our inheritance. In verse 1 of Genesis chapter 25, it starts out, Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. I think it's kind of interesting that he got married again, because he was 137 years old when Sarah died. So, <laughs> he, was, he was really old, you know, even back in those days. But it says that she bare him Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. So it names six sons here that Abraham had with his other wife, Keturah. <laughs> so he had a lot of descendants, a whole lot of descendants. Now it goes on to say that his second son, Jokshan, begat Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Ashurim and Latushim and Laumim. And the sons of Midian, Ephah and Epher and Hanak and Abada and Eldeah. All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. Now that's kind of interesting too. He had all these sons, besides Ishmael, which he had with Hagar, but he gave everything to his son Isaac. Well, he was, he was the promised son. And it's, it's kind of interesting because nowadays parents are careful not to have a favorite. You know, I've got three sons, and then I've, I've got three stepchildren. So I, I've got six altogether. Between Debbie and I, we had six kids. But of my three sons, I, I don't ever want to put one above the other. And I've never done that. I'm careful not to do that. Um, but back in those days, you see it quite often, where one son would be favored but usually it was because of a decree from the Lord or uh, maybe because that son was more responsible. <laughs> maybe that particular son had an anointing from the Lord. Which, in this case, that's what it was. Now in verse 6 it says, But unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts. So we see here that he didn't completely ignore his, the other uh, children. He gave his gifts to the sons of the concubines. So this tells you here, not only his wife Keturah, but he had concubines. So how many kids did this guy have? I, I don't think we really know for sure. He had Hagar, Sarah, Keturah, and now we find out that he had concubines besides. But it says that he gave gifts to the sons of the concubines. Now, you know that he had daughters too. It doesn't mention those. But I mean, sure, I'm sure with all these children, it wasn't just all male offspring. I'm sure he had a lot of daughters too. But it says that he sent them away from Isaac, his son, the other children, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. So where in the east would that be? The Afghani people, the Afghans, or would it be? the Pakistanis. If you think of all the countries that are east of Israel, there's a lot. India. It could be that a lot of the, the Indian people are descended from Abraham. We just don't know for sure. Verse 7, And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, an hundred, threescore, and fifteen years. Now, a score 
was 20. So three score is 60. So he lived 100, three score, that's 160, and 15 years. That makes a total of 175. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him. So Ishmael came back from where he lived in order to bury their father. So here we see Isaac and Ishmael together here, and they buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre. Now, if you haven't listened to uh, the video I did on the cave of Machpelah, I highly suggest you go back and listen to it. There's a lot of interesting stuff that I put in there about that cave. It's still there to this day. It's in the middle of the city of Hebron. And it's really, really interesting if you look into it. Uh, supposedly, uh, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and uh, his wife Leah and Adam and Eve were supposedly buried there originally. It's quite interesting. Verse 10. The field which Abraham purchased... Well, it's, it's going on here that they buried him in the cave of Machpelah. Let me go back. They buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth. There was Abraham buried and Sarah, his wife. Okay. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lahai Roy. Now there's the, the well, Beer Lahai Roy again, which means the well of the one who sees me. That's where Isaac decided to uh, camp at, where he pitched his tents, or whatever it was that they lived in. I believe it was tents. Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. So then it goes into uh, Ishmael's descendants in verse 13. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael, by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth, and Kedar, and Adbiel, and Mibsam, and Mishma, and Duma, and Masa, Hadar, and Tima. Jatur, Naphish, and Kedimah. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names. By their towns and by their castles, twelve princes according to their nations, uh, generally lands, territories back at that time, were named after the person that started the settlement there. So that's what it's saying here, that... Uh, these are their names by their towns and by their castles, which would be castles. Uh, I'm not sure. I didn't look up the, the original Hebrew word of that. I would imagine that would be fortresses. And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. And he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. So it kind of skips quite a ways ahead there uh, Abraham died and then and then Ishmael died which he was oh probably 17 years or so older than Isaac verse 18 and they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur that is before Egypt as a goest toward Assyria and he died in the presence of all his brethren so that kind of fills, fulfills the prophecy there that it talked about when, when the angel appeared to Hagar and said that he would be a wild man and he would dwell in the midst of all his brethren. Verse 19, And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban the Syrian. 
I, was, I thought it was kind of interesting here that they call the area they're from, they call them Syrians now. Now, of course, this was written by Moses years later. According to tradition, that's what they say, that it was written by Moses. But they call them here Syrians from Padan Aram. Whereas before, they said that they were from Haran. Verse 21, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. Okay. So obviously it didn't go on as long as it did with his mother, Sarah. Verse 22, And the children struggled together within her. So she was pregnant with twins. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. She, you know, back then they didn't have ultrasounds or anything like that. And she felt that there was a conflict in her. So she asked the Lord what was going on. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Which is not customary. Normally, the, the older one has the birthright and all that. But that's what God told her before they were even born. Verse 24, And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. God told her. And the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. And the name Esau means he that acts or finishes. That's interesting. But I always thought, ever since I was a little kid and I heard this, I always thought it was strange that a baby would come out hairy all over like that. That's really strange. And obviously it was red hair. Or unless it's talking about blood. But of course, all babies are born with blood on them. So I don't think it's talking about blood here. I think it's talking about that he's actually red. Maybe the, the hair is red. Verse 26. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. Now, the name Jacob means that supplants or undermines, or he that supplants or undermines. And I guess she named him that because he grabbed a hold of Esau's heel. And that's very interesting because, because of what happens later on. Verse 27, it says, And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. Now the word there for plain, it sounds like, uh, yeah, I, I'm not, I prefer the King James, but some of the way that they translated some of these words is kind of strange, especially nowadays. When you consider this was translated back in 1611, and the English language has changed quite a bit since then, but it's still the most accurate translation, and that's why I stick with it in English. Um, but it's, it says that he was a plain man. Now, the Hebrew word for plain there is tom, T-A-M, it's pronounced tom. And what that means is an ordinary, quiet sort of person. In saying that he's plain, it doesn't mean that he's drab. <laughs> you know, that's what it sounds like. Uh, he was just plain, ordinary. It doesn't mean ordinary. It means that he was an ordinary, quiet, stay-at-home kind of person. I imagine that he was probably studious and, and things like that. Verse 28, And Isaac loved Esau 
because he did eat of his venison. So right here, we see a little bit of favoritism. Now, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say whether or not they displayed any type of favoritism so that their sons would know. But the word is telling us there, the readers, that Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. So he, he, he liked the, the meat that he caught, you know. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Verse 29, and Jacob sod pottage. Now here's another weird King James translation. Jacob sod pottage, S-O-D. He's not talking about a, 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 a chunk of grass here. <laughs> the word sod, what that means is boiled. So he was making soup, like a soup or a stew or something like that. The Jacob sod pottage, he boiled soup. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. So he had another name. A, a nickname? Not sure. Edom means red, earthy, or of blood. So that could refer to quite a few things. Of blood, uh, maybe because he's a hunter. You know, because he kills these, these animals. Uh, earthy, because, well, he was certainly earthy. He was an outdoorsman, obviously. Red, because he had red hair? I'm not sure. Verse 31, then. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. <laughs> now Esau just wanted some of the soup. Jacob says, Sell me this day thy birthright, because Esau was the firstborn. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? <laughs> he didn't care. I, the impression that I get from Esau is that he's just totally uh, fleshly. He's just, uh, all he cares about is, you know, the the land and the, the, the hunting. And he was probably built, you know. So he went out and he hunted and brought these animals back. He, he you know, he was a, uh, he was kind of a rough outdoorsman type of guy. Uh, I don't think he was very spiritual at all. And maybe he wasn't real intelligent as far as like being book smart and things like that. Um, he was a real natural, just real rough kind of physical kind of guy. <laughs> he said, what profit shall this birthright do to me? <laughs> he didn't care about it. And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swear unto him and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. His, his inheritance. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. So it was a vegetarian soup. There probably wasn't even any meat or anything in it. It was some type of soup or porridge or something. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus, Esau despised his birthright. And that's how the chapter ends. He despised his birthright. <laughs> now, the spiritual implications of this are, are huge. They're just huge. <sighs> we are physical creatures. We live here in, in a physical realm. Now, if we choose to ignore our heavenly inheritance, which Jesus has provided for us through the cross. As Christians, we're storing up treasures in heaven. And we can put the flesh above that. We can choose to sin, uh, to do any types of sin. You know, we can choose, like, say, to commit adultery. And so then we're, f we're throwing away 
our heavenly inheritance by going after fleshly lusts. This is what this shows us. And that's what, that's what it was like to God, that Esau despised his inheritance. He didn't care about that. It was more important to him that he just eat right now and satisfy his body. Now, in Malachi chapter 1, the very beginning of the, of the book of the prophet Malachi, it's the last book in the Old Testament, but at the very beginning of this book, in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. So, Malachi is prophesying to the people of Israel. The Lord is, is speaking through him. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Okay. So now he's talking about... I don't think so much that he's talking about a, a specific individual. You know, that he, he hates an individual or he loves this particular individual. He's talking about what they've done. He loved Jacob because... Obviously, that he loved the things of the Lord. And he valued this inheritance. Esau did not. And the Lord hates that. It says right here. He hates that kind of attitude. You know, if you think it's more important to do whatever you feel like doing, what your body feels like doing on this earth because it feels good, do it. The Lord hates that. That whole mentality is Esau. But it also illustrates here that we are created in God's image. All the feelings that we have, God has also. Yes, God is love, but he also hates. He hates sin. There are things that he hates. Um, he has, he has happiness, he has anger, all of those things he has also, because we are created in his image. Okay, now in Romans chapter 9, verse 10, it talks a little bit more about this. This is the Apostle Paul. And he said in, uh, in verse 10, Romans 9, he says that uh, when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So it had nothing to do with what they had done. It had to do with what God ordained ahead of time. That's interesting. Verse 12 it was said unto her, unto Rebecca, the elder shall serve the younger, before they were even born. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So now here, he's quoting the scripture from Malachi that I just read. It is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? because he hated Esau. God forbid, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Who are we to judge God? To say what he can do or what he can't do? He's God. <laughs> It all belongs to him. So we have to remember that. But it shows us here that he hates. He hates uh, physical 
desire like that that usurps your common sense that takes over your body and causes you to do things that are against the spiritual nature of what God would have us to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just uh, hand this whole endeavor over to you, Lord, and I, uh, I've handed it over to you from the beginning. I ask that you'd prosper this word going forth, that you would grow your word in the hearts of your children and and that your word would prosper and wherever you would have it to go and lord we uh we have faith in that and we know that uh your will will be done in the earth and we ask that you'd keep us away from worldly lust lord help us to keep focus on what you would have us to do on the spiritual riches that are laid up for us in your kingdom We know that they're far beyond anything that we could possibly see or imagine. And we just thank you for it. We give you all the glory, Lord. I ask that you'd bless all my friends and uh, prosper them in all that they, they do. And we just thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'll see you soon. It's humid out here today. I'm gonna get inside. Love you all. Bye.